a little late with the traffic. So I'm returning to an old friend, Pseudo Dionysius. Usually I have some charts made up, but because of the difficulties on the road, we'll do without them and go purely by the blackboard tonight. Ah, here is the thesis I would like to present this evening. Pseudo Dionysius is one of the great figures in Western European history. He gained the title of pseudo, fake, because of the clever work of Lorenzo Valla. If you ever want to do some work exploring uh, medieval a late medieval Renaissance figure, study Lorenzo Valla. He made a study of church scriptures and affidavits and pronouncements and edicts, and went through them and discovered all kinds of interesting things after he judged that they were all forgeries, a number of them were forgeries. In his work, he showed that Dionysius presumed to be the companion of St. Paul, and in his ten letters, one of which describes the crucifixion, this was considered to be the primary source, his writings were the primary source for Christian metaphysics. And not only Christian metaphysics, but a certain view about history and the development of human thought and the development of philosophy all came out of this one man. And it provided a way for the church to feel quite secure that there was a higher role for revealed metaphysics than there was from any rational exploration of metaphysics. The basis for that was this. Consider two parallel lines. And up here at the common point have Moses. Over here have some of the great figures in antiquity, Hermes, Trasmegidius, and Aglipos, and um, Pythagoras, a whole bunch of people like that. And, and have the view that they were contemporaneous with Moses. Then along each side of these, my figure, place the prophets, and then Paul, all right, the Gospels, and here a very key place for our friend Pseudo Dionysius because he was said to have been the companion of Paul and was the witness to the crucifixion. He was closer to anyone else, to the formative stages of Christianity. In his 10 letters and two works, he laid the foundation for Christian metaphysics. Now, succeeding thinkers, now let's put Plato here. Plato, all right. Above him, Socrates, Parmenides, others. And after Plato, Aristotle and others. But what's most interesting is when we get here about 470, we have Proclus. All right, at 270, we have Plotinus and other thinkers between them, Iamblichus and Porphyry and people like that. The writings of Pseudo Dionysius could be demonstrated to have anticipated all of these philosophical thinkers. That he contained in minuscule the entire system of thought that took hundreds of years to develop 
he anticipated it and put it together in a very, very interesting and succinct package. Uh, they're remarkable what he did, absolutely remarkable. And therefore, it gave the church quite confidence that this is called the double revelation theory. One right, by faith and one by reason. And therefore, they could see the path of revelation based upon reason was partial. Partial. On this side, it came full both historically and its revelatory character and its intellectual force. And as you probably all know, when just um, Emperor Justinian closed down the schools of philosophy at 529 AD because the the philosophers were writing tomes against Christianity and were indifferent to the evangelical movement going on. They wouldn't be, it couldn't be converted. He closed down once and for all Plato's Academy at 529 AD. And from that point on, no teaching of philosophy was permitted in public. You could study some of this if you were in the upper classes, but no public instruction was tolerated at the point and the risk of death. The philosophers, therefore, in Plato's Academy, the last great school of philosophy, they moved to Syria and started an interesting style of development of thought. Syria became quite a center, later Baghdad, later Islamic Spain, and so that ended Platonic philosophy in Europe until it returned in the 1500s when out of Constantinople just before it fell the last remnants of the old Greek Empire sent to Florence translators texts mathematicians philosophers and that started the great translation boom they sent some works earlier than 1500 because the movement was going on. They saw the inevitability of the collapse of the old Greek Byzantine Empire. So for approximately 100 years, they were shipping works, but they reached a high point at this point where translations began. Among the people who picked up the study of Greek was Lorenzo Valla. And he decided to make a careful study in the Greek of the writings of Pseudo-Dionysius. And he said, excuse me, gentlemen, I have something disturbing to show you. And he showed that this could never have been written when it was said to have been written. And he pronounced the whole thing a forgery. That's where he gets the name Pseudo. When that fell, this fell, this whole theory, the double, double revelation. It didn't fall completely for another 200 years where a Frenchman by the name of Isaac Casubandu pointed out that the dates involved in these cross parallels are all out of place and therefore the whole thing was discredited. St. Thomas Aquinas Albert Magus, the great theologian, St. Thomas Aquinas, depended heavily on the writings of Pseudo-Dionysius and the construction of their system. And the Summa Theologica, which is the great work of St. Thomas Aquinas, sometimes simply called the Summa, he quotes Dionysius, Pseudo-Dionysius, 1,700 times. When he was quoting Aristotle, it turned out that he wasn't quoting Aristotle, but a work that came in to Europe about the 12th century, which was Proclus's Elements, once attributed to, is, to uh, Arabic thinkers. Not pagan. These are all pagans. Yeah. So look here. 
What are we going to do about this? What I'd like to take a few minutes out, and I have a couple of pieces of paper to read for you, is during the period of, well, you could really say from er the earliest days in Europe, there was the great expectation that if they ever could get back the texts of these great philosophers and thinkers of the ancient world, that there would be a burst of energy and the whole system would reveal a great wisdom tradition. They could walk among the ruins. You know, ancient ruins were more magnificent than anything they built or had seen. And therefore, they knew the ruins, they lived among the ruins, and they had these dreams of these great men of the past if they could only get in touch with their knowledge and wisdom. Now came all the literature. So important was this wisdom tradition that when the de' Medici's, who funded the first Plato's Academy in Florence, right, at 1490, 95, 90, was run by Ficino, he was the great translator and philosopher in his own right. The first work that the de' Medici's wanted to see translated was not Plato, not any of these thinkers. They wanted to see what we call today her hermetic literature. That's what they wanted to get, the wisdom tradition, because the Hermetic was seen as the Egyptian literature. They thought it was very ancient. They thought it was simultaneously or concurrently with the writings of Moses. They were only off, you know, 1,400 years. But that was the great drive to get this literature translated and get it out. There was high expectation that it would transform the whole culture. Now, then, remember now, we're going to be talking about this literature as it came out and had an impact on the culture. That's all we're going to do for a few minutes. Here came the flood of translations. Plato came in 500, 1500, 1505, and many other translations came pouring out. They flooded Europe, Latin translations. Had a major effect. The writings of Pseudo-Dionysius, were regarded as equivalent to, to the Bible itself. They called it the second Bible. They regarded it as so serious, they thought that if anything were to happen to that literature, they would lose the whole development and the way of seeing Christianity as a rational structure. At this time, it was inconceivable for someone to say, that if you were a Christian, you weren't rational. Because they included all of these writings, they could include all of these writings, they could find a way to bring them together because of this man. What he did in the most remarkable way, simple way, is that he saw the end of the old Greek culture. Now, look at the date, 529. The writings of Pseudo-Dionysius appear for the first time at 530 or 531. They were found in an interesting country. Can you guess which, con which country? Syria. The Platonists, therefore, who were exiled, fled Athens, landed in Syria, and among them must have been this person who did an amazing thing. He took this tradition, he took this Greek philosophical tradition, and he boiled it down, he, he compressed it down to its most fundamental elements. He gave it a Christian image, and he loaded it with Christian symbols, sufficient to pass it off as Christian metaphysics. But in essence, it was nothing other than Platonic thought being disguised as Christian as it entered then into Europe 
And therefore, Christian metaphysics was nothing other than Platonic metaphysics brought into Europe under a disguise. Pseudo-Dionysius. Now look, look here. For a long while, it was accepted as genuine. People accepted it as genuine. And I have a couple of quotes. There are many quotes you can get about this period. And uh, I just brought a few of them. The Bishop of Ayr, Francois Dufault, okay, thought that the Hermes, Trismegidia works, attained to a knowledge of divine things, surpassing that of the Hebrew prophets, equaling that of the apostles and the evangelists. They believed Hermes must have lived at a date earlier than Moses, and he must have been divinely inspired. He published a French translation of the Hermetica. He repeats these statements and seems almost to elevate the works of Hermes Trismegidius to the level of canonical scriptures. French translation of the Hermeticus included a French translation of the Hermetica along with the Crater Hermeticus dedicated to a cardinal, Charles, Charles de Lorraine in 1549. Religious enthusiasm was high in making headway in the French ecclesiastical circles. The first edition of the Greek text of the Corpus Hermeticum was, was made available in 1554. A translation was made. A preface by Virgilius stresses the resemblance of Hermeticism to Christianity and states that Hermes the Egyptian lived before the Pharaohs and consequently before Moses. There are many quotes. In the preface to Tyrad's work, the Bishop of Evreux, a, uh, eventually a cardinal, emphasized that embracing the works of the classic Kabbalists and the Hermeticists brought the Hebrew tradition into a new unity. And there are many other. Now look here, let's take a look at what this means. It means that at one time, Western European cultures had been hoping for a return of the classic age with a return then not the return, they never had it before, with the translations of these ancient works. It brought about a great renaissance. People then expected would be natural because this combined both a rational as well as a spiritual system. The two could be interchanged. There were one, there was no problem in finding any opposition between the use of the mind and the development of the spiritual life of man. This was a very interesting period of time. So much so that some of the thinkers were saying that the writings of, her, of Pseudo Dionysius could be considered on the par with scriptures. Then came the implications of Allah's work, when he said, excuse me, this is based upon a forgery. And Isaiah Casabandu, when he pointed out that these dates were all in error. At the same time from Islamic Spain came great translations at the same time. Of course, they were doing that for 200 years before. 
and therefore with this came a whole drive of mathematics from the Arabs, works on astronomy, woke up people, gave them a new hope, a way to understand nature as well as themselves with an ecclesiastical order. Then a silence fell over it all. Because the implications of this are pretty serious, aren't they? Lorenzo Valla also showed that the Vulgate translation, Latin translation of the Bible, had very interesting parts which are very questionable compared with the Greek, which was now coming in from the East. Therefore, the metaphysics was in question. The very translation, the foundation of the Catholic Church, the Vulgate, St. Jerome's translation of the Bible was in question. Another work of, Dionys of Lorenzo Valla, he questioned the need for the Catholic Church and showed that the basic doctrines of the Catholic Church were based upon forgeries called the Donation of Constantine. Therefore, along came a chap by the name, I wonder whether you remember his name, Luther, Martin Luther. He looked at this and he said, wait a minute, we need a new translation. We don't need the metaphysics. We don't need to be attached to Rome. Then came the Reformation. With it came the drive to establish Christianity in terms of the Bible alone. Base, the, base Christianity on the Bible alone. That's what they did. The New Testament alone. Forget everything else. Well, then the universities that were supporting these intellectual systems no longer had any need to support them. And therefore, there was a silence and an end to this kind of serious study, and it was abandoned. It was abandoned, except for a few scholars, because to return to it with any serious intent would be run many a risk. Now, What has happened historically now, up to 1996, 1997, is that people have found that try to base Christianity on the New Testament is fraught with peril because it cannot be done, because it doesn't support the Christian theory. The very basic concepts of Christianity cannot be found in the earliest writings in the New Testament, that's all. This has had a profound effect on many people. What does that mean? Do you know what that means? That means this whole development for some 500 years has been an error. That's all. It's been an error. The whole thing's been an error. Mistake. Because there is now another silence because you can't reconstruct Christianity as it is expressed popularly from the writings of Paul. You can't find that in the, in the, new, in the Gospels or you can't find it in the early writings of Q or the Gospel of Thomas. You can't find any support for it. So now theological and theological circles, there's a new silence. What are we going to do? What can we base it upon? It didn't work. It didn't work. Two consequences from this. Now there's a new movement in theology that says, look here. Christianity developed for hundreds and hundreds of years. It didn't develop because the Pope sat down with the Bible, the New Testament, designed edicts based upon the New Testament. 
He did it to meet all kinds of needs and purposes that developed Christianity. Christianity, therefore, is a tradition. It's a tradition. It developed its views th throughout its history under all kinds of needs, historical, psychological. And just because it can't be based in the New Testament or Q or S Gospel of Thomas shouldn't make any difference. What has developed, therefore, is the latest thinking is a myth. The new thought is, look here, it is a myth. It's mythical. There's no basis for it. It's a myth. Okay, let's accept it as a myth. It's a myth. Only would you not agree the idea of myth and the word mythical are at odds with one another. Well, but that's the latest. This is where they're going. This is where they're going. Take the reality of what's been demonstrated then the only thing to say is that Christianity developed historically without recourse to the New Testament. And it can't be found in the New Testament because it never developed out of the New Testament. It's quite obvious now. Now what can we do? What, what can be done? Well, look what happened. To do this, to do this, European culture found a way to bring in all of these translations, prodigious effort. They brought all of these. They have rediscovered our past. See, look here. They rediscovered our past. Because the past is pagan. Pagan means people living in the countryside. All of these thinkers, the spiritual roots of Western culture, are pagan, are Greek, what they call Hellenic. Well, all right. Do we have to throw out the New Testament because the basic ideas of Christianity cannot be found in the New Testament? If there's any reason to keep it, that same line of reasoning to keep it will be equally binding to keep this. But look here. From 529 AD, there has been a very serious, very, very serious historical movement to wipe out the old gods of the Greeks and the literature and the education. That's what was called the Dark Ages. It was so effective, it was a dark age. Now look here, if it turns out that it may be that Western Europeans' cultural and spiritual roots are with the Hellenics, we now have the material to go back and take a look at our past. Why do we have to be at war with our past? Now we're the only people in history that have a cultural genocide. We have destroyed our own spiritual roots. We've destroyed the, we, 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 we destroyed this. <laughs> we wouldn't let our people have the text. It wasn't taught. It wasn't developed until it came back into Europe in 1500. And then it only lasted for a couple of hundred years before people realized that, uh-oh, based upon several fictions, let's not go any further. And so there was that great silence we spoke about. But the same silence and the same levels of criticism are now applying to Christian scriptures. Well, if scholars are right, and there's hundreds of them, and they're all coming to the same conclusion, that you cannot base Christian belief on the New Testament. You can't base it on the earliest writings of the New Testament. It doesn't fit with Q. It doesn't fit with Mark. It doesn't fit with the Gospels. It only fits with Paul. Therefore, historically, what has been developed is a Pauline Christianity. That's the first conclusion. You drop Paul, you have a different kind of Christianity. Totally different. 
If you base your Christianity on the Gospel of Mark, you have no resurrection. You have no resurrection. Because what was added to Mark was the resurrection. It ends at 16.8, it ends at the tomb. It's over, that's it. That was added hundreds of years later. Now, let's see if we can create something. We now live in a double silence. The first is, after great work, our past was rediscovered, brought to us, and now it's not accessible. It's not accessible to us because it's not taught as a wisdom tradition. It's taught in only certain colleges in certain ways for peculiar games called scholarship. It's not a living, ongoing tradition. It's only recently, and I mean since World War II, that there's any attempt to get the best of the Greek works out into English and retranslate them since they haven't been translated again for 200 years. Well, wait a minute now. Let's go one more step and then we can call what I want to talk about as the bridge. If our true heritage is really one and two, let's accept both. And who cares whether he was a forgery or not? Because if you want to be very strict about it, much in the Bible can be criticized. Many of the sections of the Bible can. If we accept, however, what has been developed historically, we might then be able to say, why not make a synthesis of these? Let's do it. What is being presented in both? What makes this quite interesting is that works in the last 20 years have shown that there's a common root to both of these traditions and that there's a very interesting affinity and transformation of Judaism by the Hellenic, the Greek tradition. And therefore, it may only be, watch it now, here comes the first one, there may only be a Hellenic tradition, period. That's all, it's only Hellenic tradition. Judaism is transformed by the Hellenic tradition. The writings of the Gospels, you can take the, the basic Gospel of Mark and you can see it structured exactly like a tragedy based upon Aristotle's principles of tragedy. Therefore, the Gospel of Mark should be acted out as a tragedy along with other tragedies. We should include it within the literature of the Hellenic tradition and we should try to get back into the ancient world to discover the roots of its wisdom and restore it not just in text, but rediscover it as a living experience. How are we going to do it? Well, the bridge. Here's the bridge. All right, all set for my bridge. Looks like the Golden Gate Bridge, you're probably right. See, this was the Hellenic. This was the Judaic Christian. And there was no way of getting across this. There was no way you could transport yourself through it. At periods in Western Europe, if you even tried to, you were subject to punishment, death, for trying to get back over here. There was no bridge. There were only rumors of the past glories. And now, we've got hundreds of years where there's been silence. The tradition has been broken. What do I mean by that? I mean, like in Hinduism, you have the Reg Vedas, you have the Upanishads, you have Shankara, you have all of their spiritual giants. They were never destroyed. They kept them alive in their culture. Same thing with Buddhism. Same thing with Taoism. 
we're the only people who have turned genocide on our own tradition, our own spiritual tradition. Well, is there something there worthy of it? Well, there are many works now that show, without a shadow of a doubt, that you can take the Eastern writings of Shankara, you can take the writings of Nargajuna, you can take the Taoist writings, you can take most of the great works in the East and the Near East, and you can say for each one of these, there is its parallel over here in the Hellenic spirit that for every point they're making you can find parallels developed much more rationally, more coherently, and more beautifully. That is to say, this system, this system can in fact stand on its own and is a great repository of wisdom. But how do we get it? Well, there are a number of people, as I say, who have made all of these comparisons. They already exist. But how can people who are raised as Christians, part of our culture, you know, it's part of our culture, Christmas, Easter, it's all part of our culture. Is there any way to get back? <clears throat> you know what, do you know what Pseudo Dionysius did? He saw the end of the Hellenic world. He saw it collapsing in front of him. There he was in Syria. He saw the end of it. He wanted to save it in essence. So he fabricated ten letters, two works, passed it off as Christian literature, and therefore it entered into, it entered into the development of Christian thought. You can go backwards the same way. You can go back the same way. You see? You can go back the same way. Now that we're here, you can use, we can study pseudo, we can study pseudo Dionysius because that was the mean, that was the mean that transformed Christian metaphysics. It provided the spiritual roots for Western Europeans for, two, for 1,500 years. So it went this way, sneakily, pseudo. If we turn around and decide to look at it and see what we can master with it, then that will give us, you know what that will give us? That will give us an encapsulated, brief, very brief, compact view of this entire development right here. The entire philosophical development. Compact. Neat, just a short number of pages. If we do that, then we can use that as the mean to get into this, to see whether it's worth our while to go deeper. If it transformed Christian thought into a metaphysical system of remarkable strength, we don't have to dump it because pseudo Dionysius and people like him were included in it. No need to. We can then go the other way and say, all right, what are the writings? If they're brief and simple, what do they show? Well, I thought I'd bring up a couple of ideas to show you what he showed. Matter of fact, there are only a couple. But I thought they're pretty central, so I'll introduce them. First thing he did first thing he did was this. He saw the idea of law was central to the Hebraic Jewish Judaism. He saw that if you're going to try to introduce this Hellenic spirit, you're going to have to do something about the idea of law. He said, oh, well, law, that's nomos. Right? It's the visible realm, how to order the visible realm, the political realm. Moses laid down the laws, the basic laws for men in the visible world to get along together. That's what he did, lay down God's laws. Now, the basic idea of the whole Hellenic tradition 
is based on three ideas. What's called the good, sometimes it's called the one. Right? Mind, sometimes called intelligence. And soul. Now, any two things at all, any two things at all, if they have any connection, have something they share to bind them together. Anything at all. Two bricks. If you want to get them to fit, you need some mortar to bring them together. You need a third thing that can tie these two things together. Once they're together, then it's a unity. Well, these things stand to one another just like this. A, B, C. That's a mean analogy, you see. A and B, right? A, B. There's some third thing that ties them together. The mortar is to, oh, we'll call it M as mortar is to B. Let's change the letters and even make it simpler, shall we? Let's call this C and let's call this E and call that th middle thing what's needed B. Then these two things A, B, C. Then A is to B as B is to C. That's a mean analogy. A is to B is B is C. You can express it 2 is to 4 is 4 is to 8. That's a mean analogy. What's significant then about this, you see, is that this is the highest realm of intelligence. This is soul. Therefore, there is a part of, part of man's soul There's a part of intelligence which is mean analogies. Now, what that means that, they, that the whole metaphysical world is made up of the highest vision of God, called the good, the mind of God, intelligence, and man, soul. This is a basic mean analogy. It runs through everything. Anytime you have two significant things that are joined in some way, you're playing with a mean analogy. Now, I have a very interesting quote I wanted to read you about the, the goal of this curious thing. And uh, I put a marker here so I could make it for you. This unity, this unity runs through all reality. Now let me give you the quote. It is the basis of the transmission of the good from the higher to lower levels. It is a universal cosmic order. It's the idea of kingdom, the kingdom of God becomes a totally ordered cosmos. Well, we need a new name for that. Thesmos. Thesmos is the law, not of visible things, but of spiritual things, of the nature of reality. Therefore, there are two laws. One, Judaic, Moses, the visible world, the visible laws, laws for social things, and other kind of law for ultimate reality and the way in which our universe is structured. And this same thing can be said about man. In man there is a soul, and there are three parts of his soul. The three parts of his soul are going to be linked in the same way we said a moment ago. And therefore, we're living in a universe 
in which this threesome is part of the man's being, his soul. It deals with the highest realities. Same rules apply to it. Therefore, each one of these, you see, has to be defined, described, and then their interrelationships and what's significant about them you can describe. You can then describe what it's like to experience each one of these, not to be told about it. And that's the realm of the spirit or mysticism or philosophy. This new word Dionysius brought in, thesmos. And he said, thesmos must exist before Moses. See how clever he was? He said, this order is part of the very nature and heart of reality. Now, each one of these things, if it has a separate definition, has an intel, there's something about each that can be so well defined that it means that each one has its own logos, principle. Each one has their own principle, logos. Each one has their own logos or principle. Hey, three parts of man's soul. Each one has a principle. The mind, right? the spirited part, the appetitive or the desires. Each one has its own functioning. Each one has its own rules. Each one has its interaction. Right? Well, if each has, each, each one then is perfectly intelligible and the way, but the way in which they interact is intelligible. The whole thing has a unity. The whole thing can be embraced, grasped, understood, can be talked about, shared. You can then talk, at, talk about what are the different kinds of descriptions that a soul may have as it proceeds th up through these. What are all the different kinds of experience? Next point. He then said, Pseudo Dionysius said, by the way, each one of these can be said to itself generate a series. There's going to be three kinds of souls. There's going to be three kinds of intelligence and three images of the good. Oh, wait a minute. Then you have a primary view of the soul. You have a medium one and a third. Oh, everything is in threes because it all comes from this mean analogy. This then begins to be the fundamental idea that if you get it straight once and for all, you can then read all of this literature with ease. Now look here, what carries you up and down? What's the force that drives you up and down the structure? Eros, love. Love is what moves the soul up and down. Because anytime anybody or any soul sees anything it sees as beautiful, what happens? <laughs> All right, we want to go after it. Agree? The more beautiful, the faster we want to go after it. Therefore, in the soul of man, there is a natural eros that always pursues the beautiful. Therefore, as beauty is then expressed going up, its intensity and its magnificence increases at each level. Staggeringly so. Therefore, Eros is the motive power in the universe and it's attracted to beauty and the beauty perceived by the mind has a greater impact on the soul than any physical beauty. Therefore, intellectual beauty tends to be then one of the things that men pursue because with it and through it, one can get more advanced and more interesting, penetrating insights into the nature of reality in themselves. All of this is pseudo Dionysius. Next up, he says, look here. If everything is so well ordered, that means that the very heart of reality, there's justice. because things have to be exactly where they are because that's the best place for them and they're functioning most ideally exactly where they are. They carry all the marks of their past appropriately upon them and to the degree to which they seek to desire higher, it's perfectly just for them to do so, so long as they have the means to pursue something higher. Therefore, the nature of reality is by necessity just. The driving force behind man is love 
as man sees the beautiful, he pursues it. The universe we live in is an intellectually hierarchy, hierarchy of values, hierarchy of perceptions, hierarchy of intellectual systems developed in this way, all based upon a mean analogy. He took these ideas and said, what I mean by kingdom are these ideas. So therefore, when he talked about the kingdom of God, this, was, this is Plato. This is all Plato. This is all Plotinus. This is all Proclus. This dude came along and what did he do? He said, oh, you're going to get rid of Plato, are you? <laughs> so he sat down with a bottle of wine with some of his friends, I'm sure. This is, remember, this is uh, what they call BP, right? Before pizzas, right? So when they got around with a bottle of wine, there was no pizza. There must have been something good, though. Because what they cooked up was that magnificent document, which is just only 10 letters and two small pamphlets. Matter of fact, everyone who writes about them says more than what's in their writings. <laughs> so look here. Was this fun to go through? That's pseudo dining shoes. We can therefore take it because he colors it and uses Christian terms that we are already familiar with and shows how you can then find a basis for using them. He is the mean between these two extremes. Therefore, he can be our bridge back to the classic period of time. It's natural. It's, and I like it mostly. It's very beautiful, by the way, a very beautiful piece of work. And, uh, it's available, uh, not readily available, but now that we have St. Xerox, right? And that's got to be one of the best things that's happened next to peanut butter. I think that's about equal. What do you think? All right, all right. And therefore, you see, what this allows us to do is to use it as a bridge. If you like what you read as you go through Pro Proclus, you can pick up an intellectual menu and say, now let's see. Uh, I can trace every one of these ideas back to all of these thinkers that we had on this list before, where they go in greater depth than each one, and therefore you can use it as an intellectual menu and plot your course into the past and reclaim it. Well, I got it, as I said it. Now, there's one real good book, which I have here. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to buy it, but I borrowed a copy and I got a Xerox copy, which I use. And this is Ronald Hathaway's Ronald Hathaway. called Hierarchy and the Definition of Order in the Letters of Pseudo Dionysius. The difficulty is that it was published in Holland, in The Hague, and uh, my last words on it were that the, the, it's totally out of print, and, uh, then, and uh, we should find that out. Let me write the whole title out for you. The hierarchy and the definition of order in the letters of pseudo Dionysius. Now, there are only ten letters. Only ten letters. Who publishes the letters themselves? Who publishes the letters? Them? Where can one find the actual? Just all of the letters are in here. Are in there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, if you're interested in them, if you leave uh, your name and address with me, I can get you a Xerox copy of mine. And uh, I, but you'll have to excuse it because it's somewhat. 
marked up, if you don't mind my marks on it, I'm more than pleased to, to ignore them if you can. Though there's some good art on it. So I thought I'd read a couple of lines for you from the writings of Pseudo Dionysius. I'll take eight, which is a very fine, noble one. Oh, by the way, even the order of the letters they attend matches the dialogue Plato's Parmenides. So there are all kinds of interesting cross-references between what Pseudo-Dionysius was doing. He must have had clear in his mind the Parmenides and the Sophist, pardon me, not the Sophist, uh, the Parmenides, the Republic, Gorgias. He must have had these articles, these dialogues clear in his thinking. He must have had Plotinus in his back pocket. He must have had some, some interesting chat. Um, um, And Christianity as well. In order to bring so the Christian sim symbolism. Well, you see what he does is he takes Christian symbolism and he redefines them to carry Greek meanings. Um, Once upon a time, when I was in Crete, in Crete, the holy Carpus entertained me, he being a man, if there is one, who was suited through the purity of his mind to perceive divine visions. Now he never undertook the celebration of holy sacraments of the mysteries without first having a vision in his prayers before the sacrament, a, a good omen. Nice guy to have around, right? Before he prays, he has a vision. His distress consisted in the fact that this man had made someone wander away from the church into atheism while the joyous days of his baptism were still being celebrated, and that he should have prayed especially for both, and taking God as his helper, he should have turned the one back and won over the other with goodness that he should not have left off with a warning to them, and thus he should have led them to divine knowledge so that the matters disputed by them would be decided, and they who were irrationally making bold would be compelled to come to their senses by the judgment informed by law. Behind that, see? He has a very nice case. He takes one case and he builds a whole argument for it because he's now going to introduce why you need reason and why men who are religious should enter reason and bring it about. Um, uh, let me give you one that time. Uh, I'd like to get uh, um, the reason I'm having trouble is that my, the work I was doing I did on another translation. I guess I left that at home, so I'll use this one. Here he's talking about how to understand symbols. And by talking about how to understand symbols, he introduces them to a way of understanding everything analogically. You see? Because this whole thing is analogical. Because all proportions are just another word for analogy. So he's going to have to show them now how to take any religious symbol and understand it analogically. That is, to bring, bring it to reason. Um, you 
He's going through the fact that their image of God is asleep. But I realize that you will ask for an explanation as well of God's silent sleep and awakening. And when I say that divine sleep is God's transcendence and is having nothing in common with the objects of his providence, but that awaking is the extension of his providential paideia or salvation to those who need it, you will then raise more questions about other theological symbols. And he goes on to say, okay, treat them in a similar analogical way. So if you're hearing about God being asleep, what does that mean? He's transcendent. If he wakes up, what does that mean? That means then he's coming to the salvation of those who need it. So for every, for every personification of God in any mythical language, he shows people how to understand it without the use of those images. You can keep the images, understand it analogically. That escapes literalism. Now, I'd like to add one more idea to what we've been doing, but it's pretty important. Um, as we do this and see how all of these ideas interrelate, the, uh, um, if you're willing to make one step clear, then I can conclude for you. All right. Would you not agree that the things that are beautiful and are attracted to you, whatever it is that's beautiful, you're attracted to it so long as you consider it good? The same thing, the same thing, if it's no matter how beautiful it is, if you were to discover or even suspect that there's something about it that may bring along with it death and disease, even though it may appear beautiful, what are we going to do? We'll walk away from it and be indifferent to it. Therefore, there's naturally a perception connected with beauty that we hope, trust, that there next to it is in some way connected with something good. To the degree then that Eros is attracted to and pursues beauty, because it believes that the beautiful is good, then man is always pursuing what is good. That's providence. A providential view of the universe must follow if man is always pursuing what he considers to be good. That's also in our good friend, Pseudo Dionysius, in 10 letters. So, enough. How about some questions for me? We can play on another level for a while. Uh, okay, let me, let me, since you're not asking, I, I have a, a list here that I made. Soto Dionysius, dated at this time approximately 530, one of the great thinkers was Proclus. And one of his great works are called The Elements of Theology. Each one fits in with others. The whole thing is a magnificent structure of 211 propositions. It's like a geometry book, only it's all theoretical ideas. Magnificent piece of work. When you read Pseudo Dionysius, you'll discover that he must have known Proclus. Proclus was 470 A.D. And I have uh, noted several great propositions that Pseudo Dionysius uses throughout the 10 letters. And so I'll just write down the numbers. 21, 23, 27, 28, uh, 62. It's not all, but these are the central ones. 65, 100, 103, thank goodness, 148, central, all right, 151. So if you like Proclus, you won't have any trouble going into Proclus's elements of theology and seeing this magnificent structure. 
And these are the central propositions that Pseudo-Dionysius has recourse to when he builds his letters. And uh, very tight thinking, very tight, very structured. So that's what I wanted to conclude before I forgot it. So, this is the older eros, I presume, not the newer eros. Hmm? This is the older eros, going to Greek mythology, there's, two, there's the original eros, who's like the third element or god created. Mm -hmm. And then there's the other younger eros, who was the son of Aphrodite. And I'm saying yes. There is a way of taking each of the Greek gods and understanding them as principles. Proclus did that in one of his works called The Theology of Plato. Magnificent piece of work. And you can therefore structure them out, and they all fit into threes, mean analogies. And uh, that's possible too. In other words, we stand on the verge if we decide to take the challenge, if our culture decides to take the challenge. Because the people that are doing the best work in Platonic thought today, who have a need to go back to this structure, are theoretical physicists, theoretical mathematicians, Roger Penrose, Goodall. That's where they're going. They call themselves Platonists. Because they've reached a very interesting point, you know, they've reached a very interesting point. The point where theoretical physics is reached is that the tools of investigating subatomic phys physics only allow uh, experiments dealing with one, uh, 10 to the minus 17th power. That is, you can explore things as small as 10 to the minus 17th or infer something about something at that level. And since they closed down that giant uh, um, accelerator in Texas, you know, it cost three to five billion dollars, they closed it down. It looks like we're not going to get go any further. Maybe Europe will do it, but this is the limit of our explorations. But the subatomic particles that are most interesting, you see, are at the level of 10 to the minus 33 and 34. That is to say, the theoretical work that has been done about the smallest subatomic units are now being discussed at the range of 10 to the minus 33, 10 to the minus 34. That means 10 to 33 zeros over one, right? This is the limit of technological exploration at this point. Therefore, theoretically, they're exploring this world. Now, how are they going to decide whether or not what they're thinking and what they're creating, how can you decide whether it's can be considered truer than another view, since there's no technology at this point to verify competing theories. One principle is used, beauty. Beauty. Because when they go back and look at all the theories that have been successful, they had more elegance than those that did not. And the ones that had more elegance in them turned out to be more accurate, and that was a standard they could see over the past. If that standard could continually be applied, do you see what we're now considering to be the truth of the nature of reality? Beauty. What are the boys doing? A lot of interesting work, aren't they, on the subatomic level? And the latest work was, of course, they're now including the uh, theories of uh, deep space, black holes in space, and string theory, and putting the two of them together, the smallest things in the universe and the greatest things in the universe are now brought together in one unified theory. Which really means when you go out in the uh, interstellar concepts, astrophysics, you're going to 10 to the plus 33. So you're going, in, that's the full range of our speculation. Out into the heavens at 1033, in the subatomic world, minus 10 to the 33. Interesting symmetry, isn't it? How do you figure out whether which theory is going to work today? What do they use? Beauty. That's why super string theory is considered to be a great, great innovation because uh, super, thring, super string theory posits a universe that has astonishing symmetry called super symmetry, and that may be an indication that it's true. Therefore, at the core of our reality is beauty, 
Man's efforts as he moves are based upon beauty. The universe itself is structured in a highly, highly fantastic intellectual, uh, intricate way. And the whole thing is a delight to behold and to get a vision of. Right. Therefore, if we can cultivate vision, you know where you're going? You're going to cross that bridge and get over here. Because that's what all of these boys were doing. Going into the realm of the vision by, not by artificial means, but by the use of the mind itself. So my talk this evening is how to use pseudo Dionysius as a bridge. around with Proclus? Was there a possibility that Proclus was working? The dates we have are what? Proclus at what? 470, and I think you said Dionysius was 529. 530. God, the, uh, therefore. So he, he could have been around. He could have. Since there's a overlap of 60 years. 60 years. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Well, I was just thinking that if he was, if Proclus was in some way um, drew that helped in some way draw up that document if there was any input from him. I think that's well, probably it, the most concise document he's made since he tends well, yeah, to be but, very prolific. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, his writings were, were uh, treasured yes. and passed around. So uh, they played a big, major role when they went into the Arabic world. Libra Cosa is what they called it. And uh, it's, it's quite an amazing piece of work. So, but I meant in terms of conciseness. Yeah. Oh. Um, does the Hellenic tradition get into anything about the creation of the universe? Um, hmm. um, these people were more into a metaphysical creation. How to understand the universe generated as an intellectual. So over here, they're interested in how it's created physically. Over here, they're interested in seeing how to understand how this ever could have come into existence as a metaphysical system, as a theoretical system. So, uh, while there is some interesting work on uh, creation as a physical, it comes out of Plato's Timaeus and people who reflected on Plato's Timaeus. But most of the work we've done tonight is a metaphysical creation. That's what they deal with. Why, if you have this, you have to have this. If you have this, why do you have to have this? What's the relationship between the two of them? How do they interrelate? What other ideas must you bring in in order to make it coherent? So to answer your question, primarily intellectual creation, as it were. They do have a physical side from the Timaeus, and there were many works written on the Timaeus, which has that aspect of it. I think that's our work, I think, of all people in history, European, or present day, not just Europeans, now it's anybody who can play the game, of course. We're doing the most work in physical processes that must have started the Big Bang. This is history of time, etc. Yeah, when you're getting yeah. into numbers like 10 to the minus 33, they're talking about it with respect to time that uh, mm -hmm. they have to go back beyond where physics can even be described to try to find the unified field in yeah. which the, the, That's right. the forces were all one and they believe it's back there, but it's hard to... Yeah. A universe of 25 dimensions. That's what they're theorizing in order to pull it together to one big bang, a universe of 25 dimensions. It, it's it's mind-boggling even, I mean, even with physics the way it is with the dark matter and yeah, the dark, <coughs> black holes and uh, quasars. And, and how you can have a point of uh, infinite uh, mass. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. 
no size. I mean, it's just <coughs> a, a, a quirk, no breadth, like a geometric line. Super string, no breadth, but vast power to hold one another, interrelate, upon which ends are quirks. Yeah, yeah. Um, to defend the sophists, uh, beauty does appear to be quite culturally based and relative. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's true. It does seem that way. Then, where do we get? Because to me, one of my problems I've always had with Plato is this idea of trying to get all of absolutes and. Oh, that's true. In the physical world, in the physical world. Beauty is relative. In the mind, it's not. I don't quite understand. Okay. What's the difference? Uh, the, the argument is, is uh, appeal to several factors. One is that there are people have had experiences of a luminous beauty, independent of culture and time, and they report the same things and overwhelmed with the same kind of state of mind called beauty. They describe it as beauty too. So what do you do with that? It can't be culturally bound, it can't be historically bound. And that's the only beauty which counts? Be relative. Yes, mm -hmm. it, yes it cannot be relative. For if it were relative, one would expect in different cultures there'd be a different description and understanding of this, this vision. No, that's right. Mm -hmm. I have a friend of mine who uh, believed in cultural relativity and beauty is a function of each and uh, every particular culture, and therefore he didn't have any trouble. He was an anthropologist bringing his redhead, redheaded wife to Africa because he knew the men in Africa would have no interest in her because she was redhead and they had their own vision of beauty that had to be black. And he was much surprised to discover that uh, they found her beautiful and were chasing her around. Can you imagine that? The dopes didn't even realize that was, beauty was all cultural relative. I thought that would happen, by the way. <laughs> hmm. Just playing, just playing. Yeah. When he asked the question about Eros, I thought he was asking you if it was one or the other. Was it, is it Eros the original? Then I didn't hear it right. Say it again, please. Well, the thing is that you quickly went from that to beauty. Mm -hmm. So there must be some connection between beauty and Eros that, that that you can make or say more about. Well, here is you need that connection. Well, okay. it, in Greek mythology, there's two different Eroses. Yeah. The original er Eros, and I mm -hmm. said, I presume this is yeah. the original Eros, not the second Eros. Mm -hmm. Eros. I'll, I'll take both at this point. Go ahead. Well, yes, e even in Symposium, I mean, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. going in. I can't remember which one says that, well, this is, you know, this portion. There are two different portions, and they were saying, well, this is the original Eros, and this is the oh, second Eros. That's right. So. Pausanias' description. Right. Yes, there's a heavenly and a common. Right, and I'm presuming that the Eros that we're talking about is the heavenly Eros. That's yes. 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 Isn't it Eros and Philo and Agape or something? Yeah, they have different ways of talking about them. but. Uh, the important part here, though, Eros is a power. It causes movement. It makes the soul move forward. And the desire for that which is beautiful, there is a power and a movement. And that's through the whole universe. It operates on multiple levels and is the basic dynamic of the universe, and therefore in man. So, thank you.